You are now tuned in to Talks with Sheba with your host, Dr. Sheba Holly. We invite, excite, educate, and empower. Let's talk. So men coming in um, with erection issues often don't realize that 90% of the time this is primarily a physical problem. Um, the, the breakdown in terms of where the problem can be is that 90% of the time this is a circulation problem, getting and holding the blood. It can be a neurologic problem. Um, it can be a hormonal pro problem. And it can be a psychological problem. And it can be a combination of all four of these. When men come in, uh, often they feel that this is psychological, that if they could just stop worrying about it or stop thinking about it, um, they would get a good erection. Um, and the bottom line is, unfortunately, it's mostly physical at that point. Um, they could be ultimately, you know, in the most exciting situation, um, and they still wouldn't get a good erection. Um, and one of the issues we have is that many times the partners feel uh, rejected. Um, they're getting older, they feel maybe they're less attractive, maybe their partner is less attracted to them, and so they're convinced that it's really a psychological issue for their partners. And I actually encourage um, the partners to come in for this evaluation because it's very um, useful. So for, for the partner, it really does help them feel like, oh, it's not that he's not attracted to me, it's just this is a physical problem. And that uh, can be very useful for them to know and make them feel much better about themselves uh, and about their partners. Um, some of the women come in and are, they're sure that their partners are having an affair um, because he's just not getting good erections with them. And um, most of the time that's not true. The guy just can't get a good erection. Specialty training in male infertility and then male and female sexual dysfunction. So that's really uh, what I do. Um, so my whole practice is that we have uh, a women's center where we have teams that see the women. Um, and then I have a team that sees the men who are having problems with uh, erections or any kind of sexual function. And, and they can find out more about you at www.maysmenshealth.com and also www.maysmenshealth.com. Uh, so when we talk about sexual dysfunction, the first thing someone would think about would be ER, erectile dysfunction. But under that umbrella, what, what different types of dysfunction would you be able to just give some people an idea about? Right. So under um, sexual dysfunction, we have the most uh, straightforward one, which is erectile dysfunction or ED which is where a man has a hard time getting or maintaining an erection. Lots of men can get them, but they just can't maintain them um, when they want to penetrate or, or have intercourse. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be ED. Um, then about 30% of men have premature ejaculation, which is where they're just really not lasting very long or certainly uh, not lasting as long as they need to mm -hmm. uh, or want to. Uh, we have men who have delayed ejaculation where they can't ejaculate at all. Mm. And we have men with uh, symptoms of low testosterone, including uh, really low libido. They just don't have an interest in sex. And, of course, that's quite devastating for both them and their partners. Right. So when they don't have the interest, do they realize they don't have the interest? Or maybe they're thinking they're just not attracted to who they're with or... Having... Usually the men are pretty good at differentiating whether or not they have uh, an, a good libido or not. So okay. because if they have a libido but just not towards their partners, which is the minority, then they'll find that certain they have a lot of fantasies. They may uh, still masturbate a lot. They may be attracted to other uh, potential partners, mm -hmm. but they're just not having you know sex or interested in their partner. Um, but many men will say just, Nothing excites me. I don't want to see if they're if they're straight. I don't want to. I don't get excited by seeing an attractive woman. I'm not interested. I'm not interested in masturbating anymore. I'm not getting morning erections. Like I just feel like it's a whole dead zone for me. Mm, dead zone. So what does the statistics say about how common it is for men and for women? Well, for erectile dysfunction, which is the easiest one uh, to kind of take a look at it, the estimates is that by the time men reach 40, um, 20 to you know 25% of men are having problems. 
and by the time men reach 70, 50 percent. So it's a very, very common problem. Um, with premature ejaculation, we get about 30 percent of men have really lifelong premature ejaculation. So that can be quite devastating and really stop them from being sexually active at all. We have some men who are so sensitive they actually cannot penetrate. They've never been able to uh, to penetrate. Well, we're going to do most stuff as if as people are straight, but this applies to gay men too. But you know, they, they've never been able to penetrate a vagina because they just ejaculate before they can get close enough. Um, so that's pretty extreme. Wow. Uh, with women, the estimates are that uh, at least half of women at some point in their lives will have a significant sexual dysfunction. Really? Yep. Yeah. The, the most, co- you know, there's, a, there's whole categories of that. Um, but uh, the most common actually in women is low libido. Um, and in fact, actually, there was a new drug that was just approved, which we did some of the studies on, uh, which is uh, going to uh, try to address that. Low libido. And about what age? Um, you know, it's very interesting. You, it can be at any age. Um, mm-hmm. It's often very related to testosterone. So we see it a lot in uh, young women who've gone on to birth control pills uh, because mm. that, can, that can increase uh, a protein in the blood that kind of sucks up all the testosterone, which women need for, to, just like men need testosterone for mm-hmm. libido, women need it as well. So we can see it during that phase. We see it a lot of the times after women uh, have given birth. And then, of course, a lot of people say, oh, well, you're tired and you're, you just want to be away from everyone. But often they really may have had significant hormonal changes that it's not just situational, it's also the hormones. And then, of course, all women go through menopause. Mm-hmm. Um, and that makes significant changes in hormones, which can make a significant change in libido as well. Wow. So young women, the, the, so they, you know, I'm sure they don't know that birth control could uh, impact. I've never heard no, that it's before. it's not really that well known. I, you know, I, I really, I mean, the pill has, is a very powerful tool. Yes. And at the same time, um, it can have some, you know, negative side effects that um, people have to be very careful and just kind of monitor that themselves. Hmm. Interesting. So what made you branch out? You started out with men, but what made you branch out to also include women? Well, you know, the uh, as is usual in medicine, unfortunately, and I guess as usual in society in general, is that it's, it's very male biased. Mm-hmm. And so all of the studies originally and all of the research was about men's sexual function. And of course, men's sexual function is easier to quantify. If you're just looking at erections, either you're getting them or how good are they, all of those things are very easy to measure. Okay. And the researchers were men. Um, so actually, the the man who trained me is a guy named Erwin Goldstein, who's now in San Diego. And uh, he's a, a real uh, maverick. And he started applying some of the same techniques and ideas to studying women. And uh, it really has been a total... Uh, void until now. There are just very few places that uh, evaluate and treat women at a high level. One of the reasons is that female sexual function is much more complicated than men. Mm -hmm. Um, The classic example that they always give us is, you know, if you think about men, I mean, this is obviously an oversimplification, you know, their their sexuality is like an on-off switch. (laughs) And then a woman's sexuality is like you walk into, you know, a cockpit of a plane and look at all of the, you know, the whole panel. (laughs) Uh, Because, you know, a man could want to have sex, some of us, you know, like, you know, jumping off a building, you know, um, and other, and for women, it may be that it has to be, the relationship has to be right, the mood has to be right, Mm -hmm. you know, the hormones have to be right, the time of the month has to be, you know, in other words, so there's a lot of pieces that go into it. Um, So it's been harder to kind of piece apart and, um, and figure out what the women need. Also, it's very time consuming to get a good history. And we find that in order to treat the women successfully, we're often using multiple modalities. You know, okay. if a man comes in and he has a simple erection issue, well, he may respond beautifully to Viagra and we are done. You know, I'm not really, but that's, you know, mostly done. Still to come, diagnosing sexual dysfunction. Ooh, Dr. Werner, you're really schooling us.
we all know that a good man is hard to find. And when it comes to finding a good handyman, that can be even more difficult. I want to tell you about Handyman Contracting, in business since 1980 and located in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. This is high-end custom renovation at an affordable cost. Handyman Contracting can help you with any job, including kitchen and bathroom remodeling, flooring, rental property renovations, home extensions, roofing needs, patio work, stone laying, gutter cleaning, baseboards, hanging shelves, and so much more. Handyman Contracting does residential and commercial work, and your satisfaction is their top priority. Ladies, if you're tired of making out a honey-do list that never seems to get done, contact the good folks at Handyman Contracting and leave it up to them. Great service with distinction and a free estimate when you call 202-607-1742. Handyman Contracting. Same-day services are available. 202-607-1742. My name is Andrea Lee Greenberg. I walk for Autism Speaks because my son Tyler is the single most important person in my life. Walk now for Autism Speaks. To find a walk near you, visit walknowforautismspeaks.org. For over 75 years, Geico's been about consistency, as in we've consistently helped people save money on their car insurance. And to prove it, we'll air one of our first radio commercials from over 75 years ago. At Geico, we're all about consistency, as in we consistently help people save money on their car insurance. To prove it, you can call Geico. Call us today, call us tomorrow, call us 75 years from now. That was way more consistent than I expected. Geico, saving people money for over 75 years. To the insurance company that did me wrong, I've moved on and I'm happily insured with another. Bless your peep picking heart. It was just never meant to be betwixt us. You gave me automobile insurance apprehension. And Geico has come along and in just 15 minutes given me new car insurance and made me as jubilant as a newborn lamb in springtime. <coughs> and Paul has given Geico his approval. That's one thing you never had. Joyful with another. Clara May in Columbia. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Confessions of a Potentially Perfect Parent, brought to you by AdoptUsKids.org. Okay, here goes. I know more about cooking dinner for a party of 12 than I do about packing a lunch for a 12-year-old. I know kids like things like PB&J, pigs in a blanket. Oh, and fish sticks. They do love fish sticks. Filets I get, but sticks? What part of the fish does the stick come from? I know I can read a cookbook that'll tell me how to make a red wine reduction, but where are the cookbooks that can teach me how to cut the crusts off bologna sandwiches? Oh, maybe we can compromise on mac and cheese. Can you make that with brie? Everybody likes brie, right? You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who would love to push your food around their plate. Call 1-888-200-4005 or visit adoptuskids.org for more information. This message brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt Us Kids, and the Ad Council. I'm Karen, and two very important people in my life, my husband and my father, have been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation, or AFib, is a type of irregular heartbeat. People with AFib are five times more likely to have a stroke than people without AFib. Talk with a healthcare professional today about your risk and learn how to manage AFib to prevent a stroke. Visit stroke.org slash AFib to learn more. Did you know black women die in greater numbers from below-the-belt reproductive cancers like cervical and uterine cancer? Love your lady parts. Learn the symptoms, listen to your body, and act by seeking care from a specialist. Visit foundationforwomenscancer.org. News Talk 1450 WOLAM, where information is power. You are now tuned in to Talks with Sheba. I am your host, Dr. Sheba Holly, and we have Dr. Michael Werner with us talking about sexual dysfunction. Dr. Werner, where we left off, just could you give us some uh, information about diagnosing these sexual dysfunctions? And I have a list that I, I've never seen before, and I'm sure a, a host of people haven't heard of them. Right. So um, the most fun one um, to, is uh, diagnosing uh, men with erection issues. Okay. So 
Um, a lot of times the history is your most important thing. But then in terms of trying to figure out what is going on and then what treatments are going to work for them, um, then the evaluation can, can be very intriguing. So uh, we do a history. We do, of course, do a physical exam looking at the penis and the testes. Mm-hmm. Um, we do what's called a biothesiometry, which has the sensation uh, of the penis, the sensitivity. Um, we want to make sure if you can't feel anything, you're not going to get a good erection. Right. Um, and then we will actually sometimes send them home with a machine that measures the erections that they get while they're sleeping, their nocturnal erections. Mm. Uh, a, a man who can get and maintain good blood into the penis should have multiple nocturnal erections. And, of course, we're not aware of those because we're sleeping, Mm -hmm. uh, but we can measure them. And then uh, following up on that, um, we do an ultrasound to look at the blood flow through the penis as a man's getting an erection. And then we also look at blood work to to see if there's any hormonal abnormalities that are contributing to the problem. Wow. Uh, There's a machine that (laughs) measures. Yeah, okay, I'm trying not to laugh. (laughs) I'm no, sorry. it's uh, it's not it's not my most popular machine, I can tell you, but, uh, okay. but it does give us a lot of information. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm trying to visualize this um, apparatus. It's like, whoo, okay. So, uh, you the Kleinfelter syndrome. What is so that's that? kind of so I think um, that's a little bit uh, unusual. So there are certain men who are born um, without the proper hormones uh, that push their testes to make sperm and testosterone. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting one. We actually see that more in men who uh, have infertility issues because they can't make sperm because they're not making uh, the right hormones. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's kind of one that we see. Um, In terms of the causes of erection uh, issues, really you can break it down in, in terms of the most common are the most common thing is having a vascular issue, something to do with your um, your, your vasculature, you know. Okay. Um, and that's really important to know because the uh, the arteries, in order to get an erection, you have to get blood into the penis, which goes through the arteries, and you have to hold on to it through a trapping mechanism. Okay. Um, and I, I tell people, think about a bathtub. When you take a bath, you have to turn on the water, put in the stopper, fill up the tub, water stays there, when you finish, you pull it out. So you have to be able to get the blood in, and you have to be able to hold on to it. Got it. Now, the getting in is very important. It depends on having arteries, uh, which are bring blood to any organ, that are intact and able to bring the blood in. But these arteries, of course, are smaller in the penis than they are in other places uh, in the body. Mm-hmm. So if a man starts developing erection issues, it can be a very important first sign that he's going to develop vascular issues, which could be heart attacks and stroke. Mm. Um, so it's kind of like the first thing that goes, basically. And it bas- it tells you, okay, we need to look at the rest of this guy's vasculature, and we need to make some changes if possible so that we can make sure that they don't keep going down uh, this path. So we look at their whole health. We're looking at their cholesterol. We're looking at their weight. We're looking at their diet. We're looking at whether they smoke. Do they have high blood pressure? Do they have diabetes? All of these affect um, the erection. Whew. And and we do push being healthier in society, but I, I guess people don't realize how important it is. And sex is so important to many people. They don't consider, they think, oh, well, it's my outside that they'll see that's improving and and it's not only that it's the inside and little things small things that they don't know what's going on yeah i mean i think that um it's a very good incentive it's very hard in general to get men into the health system but most men are very motivated to have good erections um (laughs) And so uh, that, you know, they could be having chest pain, they could be becoming diabetic, they could be overweight, they can, their knees can be bothering them, they're not going to walk through the door. But uh, for many men, the minute that they start having problems with erections, they are at my door. And, you know, and when I tell them that this is related to their overall health, um, you know, they really sometimes will will take this seriously. We have uh, on staff a full-time exercise physiologist who will do sophisticated testing with the patients, um, Mm -hmm. going through what their metabolic rate is, um, what their cardiovascular status is, um, and giving them exercise and diet uh, and stretching recommendations. That makes sense. That we makes get them sense. when they're vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it, it's really interesting. You say, well, they can be having a heart attack. They won't walk through the door. But if they can't get an erection, they're like, 
panicked. <laughs> they are indeed. You know, it's like everyone has their priorities, and you know, we're we're just very uh, focused. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um, what is uh, male hi- what, hypoactive sexual desire disorder? Right. So basically, that's a, a fancy name for low libido, or and libido is just a fancy name for you know little interest in sex. Mm-hmm. We actually, you know, we don't have a great word for that. But, you know, the the word that we all use is you know I'm not horny or I'm horny, and it's not a great word. But, okay. Uh, we, you know, I'm not libidinous is also not a good word. So I don't really know. But that's basically what we're talking about. Um, and so the whole area of men and putting men on testosterone replacement therapy is is really burgeoning and in a very exciting way. Um, mm. when, you, when men have low testosterone levels, they can have significant symptoms, which include erection issues, low libido, uh, low energy, uh, mm. low mood, and difficulty taking off uh, fat and putting on muscle. So, of course, no one wants those problems, which is why some men really abuse steroids. Most of the time they're abusing the mm. testosterone because they want to be muscle men. Okay. Um, but if you have a man with a lot of those symptoms who has a low or low normal testosterone and you put them on testosterone medically at, at good medical doses, not crazy man dosages, okay. um, then they can have a significant reduction in those symptoms and feel dramatically better. Um, and so, and they've made it very easy now because you can put it on topically. You can just smear it on every day. You can put it in your nose. You can put it behind your knee. You can put it hmm. in your armpit. You can inject it, you know, once a week. You can put little pellets uh, underneath the skin every three months. Um, so there's lots and lots of ways to do it. Um, um, there's still, right now, the two issues that, that people bring up are, well, will it increase, you know, my chances of having prostate cancer? Right. The answer it seems to be no, mm-hmm. um, pretty overwhelmingly. And then the issue came up, there were two papers that were published a couple years ago that said it may increase the incidence of heart attacks and strokes. So that set everyone back, you know. Right. One of the papers was thrown out. Uh, the other paper was mediocre, and about eight or ten papers have come out since saying, actually, no, the opposite is true. Okay. But there is still uh, a lot of people uh, who are fearful of putting men on testosterone. Um, and it has to be done in a systematic way that follows their um, blood work and how they're feeling and their levels and other things, you know. But it can be amazing. I would say that 90% of my patients that we put on testosterone feel dramatically better uh, by the end of the year. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty pretty amazing, actually. Okay, okay. So we have... Um, a so what we haven't addressed yet is premature ejaculation. Yes, yes. So that's kind of a very interesting one. So that was one that we didn't really look at that much, and we still don't... You know, we have Viagra for men, and of course, there's three other ones. There's Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, Dendra. Um, but we don't really have uh, an on-demand pill for premature ejaculation. Okay. But premature ejaculation can be very devastating. Um, there are many, many men who literally cannot last uh, more than uh, a minute, and many less than a minute from the time they penetrate until they uh, ejaculate. And so they're very frustrated, and of course, their partners may be very frustrated. Yes. Um, and it used to be that everyone thought, oh, wow, this is just psychological. You know, I have unresolved issues about my mother. <laughs> I learned to masturbate quickly in the back of cars. Right. You know, we really find that this is physical. This is just the way they're built. Just um, the way they're built. The, right. So that's good news for them. The bad news is that, of course, then we're not going to be able to fix it. Okay. We can cure it, um, but we can manage it. So okay. we, can, we can treat them so that they actually can last a lot longer. Um, and uh, we're very successful with that. There's different modalities. You know, there's topical anesthetics you can use to kind of numb the penis. There's mm-hmm. ways of getting men to last through their ejaculation so okay. they can just keep going. Um, and then there are pills. Um, the class actually is the is the antidepressants, which actually slow down ejaculation. Okay. Um, and so those have been very effective. Okay, great. Well, up next, women suffering in silence of a 10 year old i should have worn those earrings today i like those earrings gabby has those awesome earrings i need to ask her where she got those but that's just what she would want me to do i'll have michaela ask her for me buckle up sarah yeah but then michaela will be like why don't you just ask her yourself that's just like michaela sarah buckle up michaela is such a great name i wish i was called michaela 
There's like a dozen Sarahs in my class. Hey, we're not hitting the road until you buckle up, honey. Oh, yeah. Seatbelt. I forget sometimes because my brain is, like, busy, you know? I wonder if there's pizza at school today. Sometimes it can be tough to get through to your kids, but it's not impossible. Always make sure they're wearing their seatbelts, even on short drives. Remember, you have the keys, you have the power. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup for more information. I can make an impact in the world. As young people think that we can't make a difference, but not only we can make a difference, but sometimes we can make the biggest difference. We wanted to be the doers and we wanted to be the changers. You just have to find something that you're passionate about and use your talents and your abilities to volunteer. Volunteering doesn't have to be a chore. It really is a reward in itself. It helps you get farther in life. There is no better feeling than helping somebody else. You could see one person smile. You could tell they needed that smile, and it could really change and open up your heart to new things. A lot of things are really competitive about individual achievement. Volunteering is a way to take a step back from that. See a need, gather friends, and change the world. Changing someone's world. It happens now. This is the time. And this is when you learn, so why not start? Are you a young volunteer making a difference? Apply for the Prudential Spirit of Community Award. Visit spirit.prudential.com. As I went through school, one giant question loomed over me. What did I want to be? But in order to know what I wanted to be, I had to first decide what I wanted to make. I wanted to make more. So I became a teacher. Now I make learning a privilege, not a chore. And frustration, a tool, not an obstacle. I make working hard seem easy and giving up impossible. I make an old subject feel like a fresh thought and unconventional methods common. I make material things less important and little things like patience and kindness count. I make weekdays more exciting than weekends and classrooms feel like anything but. I make things different, which is all I ever hoped for. I'm a teacher. I make more. Find out how you can make more at teach.org. Make more. Teach. Brought to you by Teach and the Ad Council. Today in school, I learned a lot. In chemistry, I learned that no one likes me. In English, I learned that I'm disgusting. And in physics, I learned that I'm a loser. Today in school, I learned that I'm ugly and useless. And in gym, I learned that I'm pathetic and a joke. In history, I learned that I'm trapped. Today in school, I learned that I have no friends. In English, I learned that I make people sick. And at lunch, I learned that I sit on my own because I smell. In chemistry, I learned that no one In biology, I learned that I'm fat and stupid. And in math, I learned that I'm trash. The only thing I didn't learn in school today... The only thing I didn't learn today... The only thing I didn't learn... is why no one ever helps. Kids witness bullying every day. They want to help, but they don't know how. Teach them how to stop bullying and be more than a bystander at stopbullying.gov. A message from the Ad Council. News Talk 1450 WOLAM, where information is power. We're back, Dr. Sheba Holly, on with Dr. Michael Werner, urologist. We're going to talk about those sexual dysfunctions for women. Uh, that's fun, too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, again, you know, we estimate that 50% of women will have some sexual dysfunction um, during their lifetimes. Mm-hmm. You know, they're sort of arbitrarily broken down into four categories. That's kind of the way we're doing it now. But they really sort of uh, blend in uh, together. Okay. Uh, the first one, which we started talking about, was uh, just decreased libido. Mm-hmm. And that's the most common thing that we all see. And um, very, very common. And it, it used to be felt, again, that it was more uh, psychological or there's just too much going on or uh, all partner-related. So we definitely look at all of the different pieces in a, in a woman's life, but we do find that there's often a very strong medical component. Um, mm-hmm. 
you know, a woman could be totally, totally in love and attracted to uh, her partner. Let's say in this case it's a man. Um, mm-hmm. But if she has no testosterone and no estrogen, then she's going to have a very hard time wanting to have sex. Okay. Um, what's interesting about this is that, you know, with the men, as soon as they have erection issues, as we talked about earlier, like they're there, a lot of them, you know, the next day, you know, it's exaggerating, but very soon. Mm-hmm. But for women, uh, we find that it takes a long time for them to come in, especially with this particular disorder. And part of it is because, you know, it's hard to want to want it. You know, they just don't want to have sex, and so it's hard to get them motivated to, mm-hmm. so that they can want it. And, and often it is because, you know, it's really obviously a very important piece of a relationship, uh, you know, to have uh, a sexual component. Um, and so their partners uh, are really pushing them, or they can see that the relationship is unraveling. Right. Um, and so that's usually, you know, often what gets them uh, through the door. But we will find, besides the other things that are going on, we will find that if we increase their levels of uh, testosterone or DHEA, that mm-hmm. can make uh, a big difference. Now, there is uh, a new drug, a phlebanserin, that was just approved by the FDA uh, to help women with libido issues. Okay. Um, and, of course, uh, any new drugs approval, especially when it's, uh, for non-life-threatening problems uh, comes with its own controversy. But we were actually part of the clinical trials for philanthropy. And it's not, you know, it's not a perfect drug. It's not mm-hmm. like it takes women who have low libidos and makes them want to have sex all the time, which maybe wouldn't be a perfect drug anyway. But, you know, <laughs> as much as they would like, um, but it does increase their the frequency of their having relations over placebo by at least uh, one to two times a month, and that's significant if they're having very little, you know, sex. Right. What I'm personally hoping is that it kind of does for women's sexual function what Viagra did in 1998 when it was approved, just kind of blow open the awareness. So it's like, oh, I'm not alone. Oh, like lots of women have Mm -hmm. this. you know, the Internet has helped to do that because Viagra came out actually really before the Internet was so prevalent. Um, but um, women are still feeling very much alone. And also, I think even more importantly, that there's not much that they can do. Right. Um, you know, you don't want to go to the doctor with a problem if you don't think that there's anything that can be done. Mm-hmm. But we really, really can help. But it, I do feel like specifically for the women, it has to be a team approach that just gives them a lot of time. You know, so the way we've structured it is that um, each woman is seen by both uh, a therapist and uh, a nurse practitioner or PA uh, specializing in women's health care. And so we're looking at the medical and social and psychological aspects of it all at once. Okay, so you said there were four categories. You have Right. So the uh, one of the most interesting ones also is women who have pain with intercourse. Mm. So it's really hard to want to have intercourse. Uh, if you're having pain with it. Um, and so one of the most fascinating uh, issues that we treat is what's called vaginismus. So this is a condition where women literally cannot let anything uh, into their vaginas. So some okay. of them have never uh, examined, you know, had a pap smear or uh, an exam. Uh, sometimes it's so extreme that, like, if someone approaches them, they actually, like, we call them table jumpers, they actually, like, jump off the table. They just... They cannot be touched down there, and they can't imagine anything be able to go inside. Wow. And the muscles are really tightened down. And for those women, you know, some of them are married. We've had women who have been married for eight years, ten years, and never had intercourse. Um, oh. And um, and so if they have a very minor case of just um, tightening of the vagina, you can just dilate them up. Okay. But there's other women where we actually are one of the only centers in the world that does a procedure where we bring them into the operating room and then under anesthesia, uh, we can dilate them up. Um, and it's fascinating. Even under anesthesia, they're tight. So there's some obviously <sighs> physical and psychological loop that's going on, you know, right. and then we actually paralyze the muscles with Botox. So this is not Mm. a cosmetic procedure, you know, but what it does is it means that they can't clamp down even if they want to. And then we leave them with a dilator in it. So these are women who couldn't even imagine having, you know, a Q-tip going into their uh, vaginas and they they wake up with this dilator and then we teach them how to move it back and forth. And the success rate is crazy high. You know, you take women who really have never had intercourse and the vast, vast, vast majority of them are, are able to do so. And it's very rewarding. I'm blown away. Mary, yeah. eight years. 
Yep. I'm blown yeah. away. And guess what? People are out there suffering, not saying a word. I had no idea. Yeah. No idea. Oh, my goodness. We have time for one more, and then we'll get to the fourth one after our next break. But um, what is the third category? So, again, we have women who have orgasmic disorders. So there's some women who've never reached a climax or some women who are having real difficulty reaching a climax to the point where it's just not worth it. Um, Mm. And that can be very multifactorial as well. Um, First of all, there's definitely – the pill, some pills that can, can delay orgasm. In the men with premature ejaculation, we specifically put men on those pills because <laughs> that can delay the orgasm. Right. Uh, but with women, if they're having a hard time reaching a climax, if they're on those pills, that can make it even more difficult. Mm-hmm. So the classic group of those are, are the SSRIs, the serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors, which are the most uh, important class of antidepressants. Mm. So you take a woman who is depressed and then you put her on one of these pills and then it both it decreases both her libido and her ability to reach a climax, which makes her less satisfied with her life. And, you know, it's like it goes around in a big loop. So they're very valuable drugs, but we do have to be aware that that's a very common side effect. Um, so we will actually in those situations, we will try to switch them over to drugs that have less sexual side effects. And we use something called Wellbutrin or Brintilex, which are different different classes uh, can be more useful for that. So that's one of the things that we look for. Uh, But we're big, big, big fans of vibrators. Um, Uh (laughs) The the woman who uh, who runs uh, the the women's centers, Dr. Batsheva Marcus, so she did her thesis actually on vibrators. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have an array of vibrators uh, that you would not believe, you know, uh, because one size does not fit all. Okay. Uh, And, uh, you know, (laughs) They're, they're a great tool. And the funny thing is that men love vibrators also. You know, if you put enough stimulation from a vibrator on a man, who's going to be able to reach a climax also, most of us. You're so, kidding. Uh, it's a great, uh, fun tool, you know, for all kinds of couples. Um, and we use those a lot. So. Interesting. Interesting. So when a woman is faking an orgasm, it's usually due to, uh, I'm just surmising, it's usually due to decreased libido where they just go ahead and go through with the sex act or the fact that they can't reach a climax. Right, so some women will go, have, if you have a low libido, you'll go through having sex um, even if you're not interested in it. What's fascinating is that some women with low libidos uh, it's a, still have great orgasms. So they may like, they just don't want to have it, but once they're doing it, they love it. It's almost like exercise, you know, like <laughs> I never want to go to the gym, but sometimes <laughs> when I'm in the pool, I'm loving it, you know? So it's like, it's some libido is almost, what is your threshold for getting there? Mm-hmm. And then in terms of an orgasm is like, so some women might have a great libido. They really, really, really want to have sex, but they just can't reach a climax. You know, mm. but then of course they can be related. If if you never reach a climax and both of you are always frustrated, then you know then your libido may suffer. Just like men with bad erections, you know, with erection issues, may then start losing their uh, interest in sex because who wants to do something you're going to fail at? Ooh. Oh my goodness! I just got dizzy. <laughs> I just got dizzy. But when we return, we'll hear category. Category oh. four. Category four, yes. Yes, I'm, we'll I'm, hear about category. on to that. Okay, you're holding on to category <laughs> four and also some treatments. Dr. Warner, you are hilarious. Um, <laughs> some treatments. Could you tell my son that he's, he's, he's a DW? <laughs> I'll, my kids always think that I have no sense of humor at all. You know? I think you do. I, <laughs> I tell them my patients and... Uh, My staff think I'm funny, and they look at me like, well, of course, they have to tell you you're funny. Well, no, not really, but you (laughs) are funny. So, still to come, treatments and support, and Category (laughs) 4 in a few. Okay, so, Sarah, I'm dropping you off at Emily's? Yep. And Josh, you're going to? Soccer, Dad. Soccer practice. Right. Oh, by the way, I just wanted to let you know when I pick you both up, I'll be wearing my short shorts. What? No! Yep, and my dorky dad hat, and I'm going to do my dad dance for all your friends. They'll love it! Seriously? Why? 
because I like my short shorts. Of course, I could be talked out of it if you guys would just buckle up your seatbelts without giving me a hard time. It's important to get your kids to buckle up for safety, no matter what it takes. And sometimes, all it takes is your parental powers of persuasion. Okay, okay, we're buckling up. See, all buckled. Good choice. I'll just have to do my dad dance at dinner time. What, what? No! Do what you have to to make sure your kids are wearing their seatbelts, even on short drives. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup for more information. I can make an impact in the world. As young people think that we can't make a difference, but not only we can make a difference, but sometimes we can make the biggest difference. We wanted to be the doers and we wanted to be the changers. You just have to find something that you're passionate about and use your talents and your abilities to volunteer. Volunteering doesn't have to be a chore. It really is a reward in itself. It helps you get farther in life. There is no better feeling than helping somebody else. You could see one person smile. You could tell they needed that smile, and it could really change and open up your heart to new things. A lot of things are really competitive about individual achievement. Volunteering is a way to take a step back from that. See a need, gather friends, and change the world. Changing someone's world. It happens now. This is the time. And this is when you learn, so why not start? Are you a young volunteer making a difference? Apply for the Prudential Spirit of Community Award. Visit spirit.prudential.com. Confessions of a Potentially Perfect Parent, brought to you by AdoptUsKids.org. Okay, here goes. I know more about cooking dinner for a party of 12 than I do about packing a lunch for a 12-year-old. I know kids like things like PB&J, pigs in a blanket. Oh, and fish sticks. They do love fish sticks. Fillets I get, but sticks? What part of the fish does the stick come from? I know I can read a cookbook that'll tell me how to make a red wine reduction, but where are the cookbooks that can teach me how to cut the crusts off bologna sandwiches? Oh, maybe we can compromise on mac and cheese. Can you make that with brie? But everybody likes brie, right? You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who would love to push your food around their plate. Call 1-888-200-4005 or visit adoptuskids.org for more information. This message brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt Us Kids, and the Ad Council. Welcome, NBA fans. Tonight, NBA Man, nothing beats up. seeing an NBA game in person. Hey, buddy, thanks again for driving. So where are our seats? Oh, we're sitting right around the corner. Hey, but before we do anything, let me stop for a second at the designated driver booth and make the pledge. Excuse me, sir, did you say designated driver? <laughs> yeah, I'm the designated driver tonight. Congratulations, you are a winner. And for being the designated driver and always buckling up every trip, every time, you have won the adoration of your friends and family who will get home safely from the game. Cool. Your prize also includes the gratitude of all of the drivers on the road who won't have to fear for their lives. And finally, you've won the chance to follow your favorite NBA team to the NBA Finals because responsibility has its rewards. Woo, yeah. To find out more, visit the designated driver booth at the arena or visit RHI. R.org, a message from this station and Team Coalition. News Talk 1450 WOLAM, where information is power. You're on with Talks with Sheba. I'm Dr. Sheba Holly, and we have Dr. Michael Werner. He's at www.menshealth.com and www. Oh, sorry, maze, M A Z E, menshealth.com and www.maze, M A Z E, womenshealth.com. Dr. Werner. Well, thank you. Um, so, number four for the women um, is. Um, decreased arousal. So that's an interesting one, and it's a little bit hard to kind of piece that one out um, in terms of how much different it is. is if your libido is low, then it's uh, and it's hard to reach an orgasm, then it's hard to get aroused. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with men, the arousal is easy because that translates into an erection. Um, but with women, it you know, it's lubrication, it's clitoral enlargement, so it's a little bit more subtle. Um, but we've actually sometimes uh, off-label 
uh, used one of the drugs like Viagra for that, just to get them more excited with uh, with reasonable success. Okay. You know, it's not an A as it is with the men. Um, so I know you wanted to segue into the treatments. Um, yes. I think that's what you had uh, booked out for me for the last uh, bit of this. Um, so with the men, I wanted to, you know, the everyone has really heard about um, the Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, um, Stendra, which mm-hmm. are the class is called the PDE5 inhibitors. Um, but people don't realize that they only work in about 70% of the men. Mm. Um, So first of all, it's really important that the men understand what we call the pharmacokinetics, meaning when do you take them, you know, and in terms of when you're going to have sex, in relation to when you're going to have sex. Mm -hmm. So Viagra, for example, um, gets absorbed into the food. So if you have a heavy meal and you take your Viagra, you're not going to get an erection. (laughs) Um, And the Cialis can take about two hours to kick in. So if you take it and then 15 minutes later you try to have relations, that's not going to work either. So Mm. we go – it's really important that the men take the maximal dosages if they need them and that they take them at the right times in relation to when they're going to have intercourse. But even if they're doing everything right, uh, approximately 30% of men will not be able to get good erections. And, of course, those men are devastated because now not only did they have a problem, but now they thought they could fix it. And now they're part of the men and they think they're alone who can't fix it. But, Mm -hmm. again, that's a big number of people who can't fix it. So the next up is something that men hate the idea of, and they sound terrible, but they're unbelievably amazing. Mm -hmm. We take this little device. We put... uh, a syringe in it, they press a button, and they actually give themselves a virtually painless injection uh, in the side of the Mm -hmm. penis. Uh, Right before they're going to have intercourse. I knew you were going to do that. uh, (laughs) (laughs) um, The thing is, it genuinely doesn't hurt. It really, like, feels like you've been flicked with a rubber band. You know, I give my wife allergy shots every week. um, (sighs) And she was like, you know, I I finally decided to give it with the auto-injector. She looked at me like, dummy, why didn't you do that 15 years ago? You know, it's like... (laughs) It's really painless, you know, and, and the men don't believe it either. Um, uh, and they've just come back from doing that Rigi scan the first time I do it when I'm doing their ultrasound, and they're like, you're right, this does not hurt. But okay. they can get unbelievable erections. Um, and so that covers the vast majority of the rest of the men, and they go from really not getting good erections to getting, you know, movie-quality erections. You said movie-quality? Uh, <laughs> yes. In fact, in fact, really, I have a producer of sex movies in my my practice and he says that's the way the men in the movies are all doing it you're kidding Um, no because you know i won't go through the mechanics but basically you know they they can last in no no man can last or you know in seven different positions for 30 different minutes you know women but you know if you have an injection if you use a little more than you need to you can do that you know so um yeah it's pretty remarkable so you get men who are having terrible erections being you know doing great um, and the idea, of course, you know, elicits exactly the same response that, that you had, but the reality is amazing. So, um, you know, when I opened my practice, my wife was in advertising, and she said, you know, well, how good are you at getting men erection? I said, well, if they have a penis, I can get them. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty powerful it's like really it's true I originally started with I can get a dead man in the right that has such a bad ring to it that I decided not to go with that one but, uh, but basically you can because then again if, if the injections aren't working then the men can have a penile prosthesis uh, put in um, oh. And basically, it just takes the place of the blood mm-hmm. uh, by putting fluid in there. It's, it's complicated. It's not worth going into. But, um, and it feels the same. It feels very natural. Okay. So basically, all men for all of their lives you know, can um, have erections. So that's very gratifying, really. I'm uh, sure. I'm sure. Yeah. So what type of support groups are available? Well, you know, it's interesting um, The we support groups it's um there since the, it's kind of a private thing we, yeah. we haven't seen that much need for support groups we definitely work very closely with sex therapists okay. because sometimes what we see is you know if a couple has and this happens a lot so let's say that they were sexual um but then things fall off he has erectile dysfunction she has low libido they have a bunch of kids that you know then people really fall out of being sexual it's kind of uh, very, very common where people are having sexless marriages. And, of course, in my opinion, is they almost 
always fall apart, or mm-hmm. they certainly their quality is much less than when they are having sex. So I'm kind of obsessed with people, you know, having sex with the right people in the right context. Right. Um, you know, in terms of making their lives great. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, but then getting them back, you can fix the mechanics, but it's still uncomfortable. Like, so you have to work with them, and sometimes we do on the simple ones, and sometimes we send them to therapists and for support and for marital counseling to get them to learn how to be sexual with each other. You know, so the, mm. they they used to call that the whole area sensate focus. So you de-emphasize having intercourse, which has become this big issue and you say, well, let's do sensate focus. Let's just do sexual erotic, erotic massages. Okay. You know, no genitals. And so you kind of move up until you're just much more comfortable being naked with each other, being physical with each other, being sexual with each other before you, you know, go for the proverbial home run. You know, he said the home run. <laughs> but, yeah. No, no, it's interesting, you know, and it's really a lot of couples are very happy and very sexual, not having intercourse. So I, you know, I, I said it with a grain of salt because mm-hmm. most people, especially men, think like there's nothing like sex is intercourse, you know. Right. And if I can't have intercourse, then I can't have sex. And of course, they start pulling back, and then the many of the women, not to be so stereotypical, are really sometimes missing the intimacy as much as they are the sex. Okay. And so everyone, you know, things start dissolving. So we have to convince the men a lot of times that the intimacy is really important, and there's really other ways of being sexual without necessarily having intercourse. Though we can get them, you know, very rigid erections, you know, invariably. Mm. So, um, you know, it becomes really a balancing act. What do you see in the psychological impact for both men and women? What do you see? Yeah, you know, it's um, there's been very good studies which link sexual dysfunction very strongly to depression. Mm. Um, and it makes sense. Your self-image is really goes, uh, gets knocked down mm-hmm. if you can't think of yourself as a sexually, a sexual being and a sexually successful being. Um, so it has, and of course, depression has serious physiological, you know, implications, physical implications on your health. So there's a real link between sexual function and sexual dysfunction and health and depression and mood. Um, you take a younger guy with sexual dysfunction and they become obsessed. I mean, literally, obsessed. Right. you know, it's like they, every, every time they see a woman, oh, I can't do that. Every time they see a man, oh, he's, he's doing better than I am. You know, it's, mm. it's, it's like, it just totally crowds out their, the rest of their life. And they, some of them really have a hard time functioning in general. So I feel like the whole area is, you know, just terribly important. Wow. Well, I just want to thank you so much for coming on with us. Um, it's been great talking with you and I would love to have you back. And, you know, if you have Anytime. a blog or anything like that, that we can connect to, um, I, I will totally do that and put it on my website because I'm sure there is a lot of people suffering um, in silence. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Warner. Uh, it's a wrap for us. So uh, you have a spectacular Sunday. And thanks for joining Talks with Sheba. We would like to thank him again. And don't forget to visit www.maze.com menshealth.com and www.mayswomenshealth.com and if you have any questions or comments call me at 866-671-4344 follow me on twitter talks with sheba instagram me dr sheba holly bottom line i want to hear from you and remember work like you don't need the money love like you've never been hurt and dance like nobody's looking we'll talk later With Shiva. Be empowered. W O L Washington.